Hello, once again, it's James here, WSI, and with me, uh, he's got to be a hardcore legend. He's homicidal, genocidal, <laughs> suicidal, death-defying, and also, I'm sure you won't thank me for saying this, a former FTW champion as well. It is indeed Zabu. How are you doing, my friend? I'm pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Well, do you know what? With ECW, it always shocks me that the one thing that still has lasted is the FTW title of all things. Yeah, it's kind of a joke. It was a joke on Taz, kind of. Oh, was it? I, I don't really know the story about FTW title. Uh, enlighten me. Well, uh, Taz wanted to be champion. Paul didn't want to be champion, so he made himself a champion. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, oh, so, so he was, it, uh, didn't really hold my, it didn't really hold any weight, really. No, fair enough then. Um, I take it you don't go around like a, with a business card saying, hey, f former FTW champion here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dearie me. I'll ask about Taz and I'll ask about a ton of different stuff, but um, there's one thing I've got to ask, and this is probably what everybody at home, at home or whoever they're watching wants to know more than anything else, is um, do you still have your Ribera Steakhouse jacket? Yeah, I got a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. When, did it, when was the first time you went? Uh, in 1991, when I first went to Japan, the first trip to Japan, we went there to eat. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to be asking you about Japan as well, though. But, like, what, do you know where, like, the steakhouse thing came from? Like, where, why is it just, like, a big deal in wrestling circles? Uh, the, the owner, uh, the, his name isn't Ribera, but Ribera is, like, a Mexican name. And he liked country music, and he liked Westerns, uh, Western type uh, music stuff, or Western uh, look, like the Terry Funk's look and the Stan Hansen look. And, and he kind of, he made a restaurant kind of a... Uh, a Western restaurant. Oh, got it. I've got. Oh, of course, yeah. Because it's a steakhouse. Of course, it's going to be a uh, Western. Um, but also, uh, like, when did you actually buy your first jacket? And was it like the law that you had to wear it everywhere? No, uh, they gave us. They give us a jacket. We don't buy them. Uh, they they give them to us. Uh, so uh, we went there and they gave them to us, and, and that was that. You know. Yeah. And every uh, time I go to the family, they, they usually give me one. <laughs> were you uh, were you also a fan of the Zubaz? Uh, the what house? Uh, the the Zubas, you know the uh, oh the, the Zubas, yeah. yeah, yeah, I used to wear those, yeah, and and the uh, and, uh, fanny pack, <laughs> the whole thing. Did you have the yeah. cowboy boots as well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how long did how long? I did actually you... had a pair of cowboy boots. It was blue leather that Taz Taz gave me. Oh really? Yeah. I even <laughs> had Taz's name on the side of the boot. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're giving him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was cool. I wore them everywhere. Yeah, no, I'll tell you what, you're right. I, I've got to ask this as well because I know everyone asks it. How's the body holding up these days? Have you had two hip surgeries as well recently? I had one. one I had one hip surgery. Uh, my other hip's still good. Uh, I'm not doing real good. My back. I hurt my back about a year ago, and it's still been hurting. I I, I wrestled a couple of weeks ago, but I shouldn't have. Uh, I've only wrestled like twice in the last year, and I only went to the gym a couple of times in the last year because I hurt my back. So, but uh, I, I'm probably gonna not wrestle no more. Oh really? Oh right then. So I thought you were actually. Uh, uh, sorry, where where are you at now? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. So you're you're pretty much done with wrestling then, because that was going to be my finale uh, question. Yeah, I, I'm probably just going to do autograph signings and uh, uh, personal appearance type type meet and greet type stuff. Yeah, uh, it's probably it's probably for the best, uh, I suppose. Is there any is there anything any any amount of money any any uh, wrestler that you'd face that you'd uh, get back in the ring for one more retirement match? Yeah, I, I'd definitely get back in the ring for Brock Lesnar. I'd love I'd love to wrestle him, <laughs> especially if it was my final match. I'd like to wrestle him. Uh, I, I'll still, I'll probably still have a final match. Just say I, I'm not in shape for it, yet, so I'm not going to try to fool myself. Yeah. How come Brock Lesnar in particular? Uh, because he's the best. You know, he, he's a, he's a shooter. He's a, he's a good worker. He's a, he's my kind of opponent. I like big guys. I like wrestling big guys. I like wrestling guys like me because it's not that interesting. It's, it's more interesting wrestling a guy like me against a guy like Brock Lesnar. You know. Yeah, definitely. So yours, um, this wasn't something I was going to ask. So like, as far as the Giants go, who have you wrestled? And we're talking not just in height, but in size. Who were like the best Giants that you uh, took on over the years? Well, the wrestling? Big Show is one of the best. He, he's really good. Uh, Mike Austin was one of the best. You know, um, uh, you know Hulk Hogan. I never wrestled Hulk Hogan, but he's one of the best. Even though he gets criticized by a lot of people, but he's, he's one of the best. That's why he's still on top. You know? Yeah, I'll tell you, people who criticize Hulk Hogan is, for one, I mean, I thought he was a great wrestler, especially in like, you know, maybe up until the late 80s. It, all His matches were so much fun, and they were always different. They didn't have the formula, so I don't know why he gets right. criticized so much. Yeah, that's jealousy, and he stepped on a lot of guys on his way up, but, but it's mostly jealousy. Yeah, definitely. Like John Cena, I've heard a lot of bad stuff about John Cena, and I can't say nothing bad about him myself. He's a good worker. Everybody told me he was a crowbar, and he's the shits, and the, you know he's heavy. 
and, and he was he was good, and he he let me lead part of the match, he, and it was his backyard. So I I give him all the praise in the world. He deserves what he didn't. Yeah, well, he's he's definitely a historian, and he's he's got all the respect in the world for you know the, the people who came before him. Definitely hasn't he? Yes, yeah, yeah. No, he, his dad said he took him to his first live match in uh, Massachusetts, where I broke my jaw. He said it traumatized traumatized. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised it didn't traumatize you. Yeah, <laughs> just about. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to take it back to the beginning. And uh, I do a weekly show with Don Morocco. He's told me a couple of stories about your uncle, the Sheik. And oh, yeah. um, I, I suppose, really, were you terrified as a kid of your uncle at the time? Or did he, or was he always, you know, he wasn't the Sheik to you? Um, I wasn't terrified. Of him. I respected him. Like, uh, I, I didn't act up, act up around him. And I've always, was, you know, I had my P's and Q's when I was around him. But, uh, you know, I was a bastard when I wasn't around him. I was, I was a wild <laughs> kid. But uh, uh, I, I wasn't afraid of him. I, I just respected him. Like, you know, I, I wasn't afraid of him. Who was uh, some of the wrestlers? So I imagine, you know, wrestlers going around to each other's houses. You must have met a few. Uh, who who uh, stick out in your mind? Well, my uncle would have uh, dinner every Sunday at his house, and the wrestlers would come by there. And uh, he'd have the heels in one room and the baby faces in another room where they didn't talk to each other. And, uh, you know, I met Bobo Brazil. I met Andy the Giant. I met Abdul the Butcher, Terry Funk. I met a hundred guys. Yeah. I remember, I, I'm sure I read somewhere that you shook Andre the Giant's hand as a kid, man. I mean, how, how much that must be burned into your memory. Yeah. I didn't shake his hand. I, I was, I was scared of him because he was so big and I didn't know him. I wasn't scared of my uncle because he was my uncle. I knew he was my uncle. I knew he wasn't going to hurt me. Mm-hmm. These other guys, I didn't, I thought they might hurt me because they didn't like my uncle, but I didn't know it was worth then. Yeah. Did you, um, did you ever actually live in Detroit for any portion of your life as a kid no we, we lived in lansing michigan my uncle lived in williamson michigan it's about 30 miles about 80 miles from uh detroit we, we never lived in detroit got you uh, so I'll, I'll ask about detroit uh, in a couple of questions time but uh this is something i genuinely don't know and uh who were the sheik's influences as far as developing his character and who did he look up to uh, who came before him uh, I, I don't know he never told me i never asked him i, I don't know uh, uh a guy named bert ruby trained him and named him the Sheik of Araby. But before that, he was called the Black Knight. And before that, he was, I think, just Ed Farhat. But uh, he went to a couple gimmicks, but then the, the Sheik of Araby stuck with him. And uh, that was that. Yeah. Of all the Sheik copycats afterwards, who do you reckon was the best and who do you reckon uh, was just a, a lazy was the they, they, were, they, they were all the shits. King Curtis was pretty good. But uh, the Iron Sheik, you know, I like the Iron Sheik. He's a nice guy, but I think he's a terrible worker. You know, I, w- I would never tell him that, but I don't think he's a good Sheik. He- he's a bad Sheik. <laughs> but uh, he's a nice guy. I like him. My uncle liked him too. But, you know, uh, um, there-, there is no good Sheik imitators. There- none of them are as good as him. Didn't your uncle actually, um, well, the story goes, that he bestowed the Sheik name and gave uh, Iron Sheik some boots to send him on his way and basically gave him no. his blessing? No, that didn't. That didn't happen. Oh. <laughs> no, no. Is that just something no. Sheiky just came up with to make it plausible? He, he must have. Yeah, he made it up. That didn't ever happen. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, I know you wrestled this fellow. I don't know if you tag, uh, tag with him, faced him, and so. But Tiger Jeet Singh was he or was he just the direct ripoff of direct ripoffs of your uncle? He is a direct ripoff of my uncle, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how did yeah. you find Tiger to uh, work with an FMW? Because I've read stories, maybe not all of them good, not the most giving. Yeah, uh, he was okay. He, I didn't like working with him too much. He's kind of pushy, and you know, he's, he's trying to protect himself. And uh, I had to wrestle. He wanted me. To, they wanted me to wrestle his son in his very first match in Japan, and me lose to him. I wouldn't do it. Hmm. And uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to lose a match against some guy's very first match. I don't care who it is. No, no. I mean, how long were you in the business at that point? Like two, three, four years? Ten years. No, I was oh, in ten years. Ten years. Oh, yeah. Jesus, and, right. And, and his son, a uh, nice guy, but he didn't deserve to beat me yet. You know? No, exactly. You've got to work your way up, haven't you? Um, were you did you ever see uh, The Sheik in Detroit when it was rocking and rolling, when it was, you know, doing huge business? No, no, no. Uh, see, they, they, he ran a territory where Detroit was one of the stops, Lansing, Muskegon, uh, Bay City. So we only w- went to the shows in Lansing, where we live. We didn't ever go to the shows in Detroit. We never went to the shows in Detroit. We, there was no reason for it because we had them in Lansing. Right. So, you, so you've actually never been in Cobo Hall then? I've been to Cobo Hall once when NWA used my uncle, the Sheik and Dusty Rose versus Kevin Sullivan and uh, Dick Murdoch, I think. And uh, that was the only time I was in Cobo Hall. All right. So then um, I'm trying to think actually. Well, I mean, I, can you explain this to me then? So uh, 
as far as I can tell, and you know, obviously I wasn't born at the time, I'm not the greatest historian in the world. How did Detroit go from doing so well, drawing so many uh, tickets, uh, you know, such a huge gate every single uh, time they went there? And uh, mm. like two years later, how did it sort of like fall apart so quickly? Uh, because uh, Vince started buying the territories and, and buying the guys to double cross, you know, the, the, buy their loyalty for him. So he, he would double their pay or whatever their pay was. And, and they quit working for my uncle and quit working for other guys too. You know? mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you what, right, I'm going to move on a bit then. So obviously you train with Rob Van Dam, your sheet trains you, and then you sent on your way to the Indies and everything. How did you end up in USWA so early? How did you get there? Well, uh, we met Jerry Lawler a couple of weeks before we went down there, and he said he wanted, he wanted us to come down, so we did. And uh, that was that. It was not It was a good experience. I, I wouldn't want to do it again. You know, we didn't make any money. We starved. We actually starved. We didn't have any money. And uh, But it was fun because we got to, you know, learn our trade. Yeah, what was with the uh, – uh, I mean, I've heard stories, you know, eating raw potatoes for sustenance. How did, how did you survive on the road? What did you eat? Well, we, I, I drank a lot of protein powder because it was cheap and easy to carry. Uh, you know, we just, we always ate at like a, a country buffet or, or something buffet for lunch. And for dinner, we always had a, a buffet where we could eat all we, all we could. Yeah. Is this where you were introduced to Waffle House? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> is it yeah. still is it still a staple after all these decades? Yeah, it's still around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, was your, what was your Waffle House order uh, to like stay clean on the road? Uh, poached eggs. I like poached eggs. Yeah. What, just like 10 poached eggs and that was it? Well, poached eggs and, you know, uh, hash browns and toast and stuff. Yeah. So who are the, who are the people that you uh, worked with uh, initially in USWA? Because I know uh, I spoke to Johnny last week, uh, Johnny Candido, and he said that's where Chris Candido got some of his first experience as well. But who were the uh, sort of like the future big-time players that you'd uh, 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 partner with? Uh, I partnered with, uh, you know, the... Uh, this guy, Judge Dredd, when we, when we first went to USWA, we tag, I tagged with him against uh, Robert Fuller and Jeff Jarrett. And that was pretty cool. And um, so any, I'm trying to think, like 1991, I'm trying to think who else was there. Like the Godfather might have been there at that time. I'm trying to think who else. No, um, there wasn't nobody there, that, nobody that I knew, that nobody was still around now other than uh, Jeff Jarrett, uh, Jerry Lawler, um, Eddie Gilbert was there a couple of times. But uh, there, there's, there was nobody there, really. Now, who was uh, who was doing the booking? Who was like the main head honcho? Was it Dundee or Lawler? Um, Jerry Jarrett and uh, and um, uh, was, uh, Jerry Jarrett and Eric Embry was the bookers at the time. Oh really? How come I, I yeah. thought Laura would have a his finger still in that particular pie at that time? Yeah, they were there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, who had the uh, stiffest working punch in USWA? Uh, besides me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Van Dam's pretty stiff with his punches. I guess so. He has hard, hard, hard knuckles. Yeah, I've always, I've always heard that Dundee was the uh, absolute worst for it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently, yeah. Apparently, a working punch from him. You, someone would rather get an actual punch from uh, somebody instead of a working punch from him. But uh, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> do you remember uh, maybe some of the uh, more rundown places you worked? Or you set up a ring somewhere and worked in. At, those times. Well, all over Michigan, all over Ohio, all over Canada. You know, I, I, my first two years, I started in Canada, uh, Ontario. I spent two years up there. And uh, I set the ring up every night and wrestled every night. That was cool. So just going back to your story, do you remember the, um, just like just the weirdest place you set up a ring and held a show? Um, well, in Japan, I, helped them, I used to help them set the ring up there. We, we set it up in a riverbed one time. They had a, <laughs> a match in the riverbed. A dried up riverbed. It was pretty cool. <laughs> How many people turned up to that? A couple thousand. So it, what, a dried up riverbed. Had yeah. Wow. Because yeah. uh, you know it's cheaper than the arena, and it was an afternoon daytime show in the summer, so we had it outdoors, and, uh, and it, it saved them a lot of money. <laughs> was it put in a riverbed? Because basically, it was almost like a valley where everyone could look down on it. It's you. like a valley, but but it's all dried up. It's like an old riverbed, like you know, twenty years ago it dried up, and now it's just a you know. A dried up riverbed. <laughs> That's actually pretty ingenious, in fairness. Uh, uh, yeah. So, when did you? Uh, I, I'm assuming it was the Sheik, excuse me, who um, got you into FMW. Uh, what was the process of, uh, you know, saying this guy's good enough and uh, to take him on for a tour? <clears throat> well, how I got booked was uh, they called my uncle, uh, Associate Nita called my uncle and wanted him to come in for uh, a tag team tournament and that uh, he could bring anybody he wanted. And he said he'll bring my, he, he'll bring his nephew. And he goes, we don't care who you bring, just bring anybody. So he brought me, 
and then uh, I got over and uh, and uh, went and it took off from there. Yeah, with uh, there's actually something I was going to ask you about USWA, but I'll ask it now. Was um, and especially when you might be going to your first like hardcore fight, uh, you, uh, you know, wrestling match with all the weapons. How long did it take for you to maybe get over the nerves of before going to the ring? I still haven't got over. It. I, I still get very nervous. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm very nervous. Yeah, how do you how do you sort of cope with it beforehand, and like how many hours before does it start? It starts a couple hours before. Uh, actually, as soon as I go to the arena, I get, start getting nervous, and then uh, I'm nervous up until I go to the ring. <laughs> well, what are you nervous about? Is it just is it because I'm I'm the same? Uh, is I, it... I'm not afraid of getting hurt. I'm afraid of, I'm not doing good, so I'm nervous about not doing good. I'm not, I'm not, I don't care about getting hurt. That's so I don't want to do bad. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough then. Well, I was, I was actually going to uh, move on back to FMW then. And I wrote a few uh, few of the uh, more hardcore stipulations. Uh, cage, street fights, uh, no rope barbed wire death. No rope barbed wire fire death match, which is obviously the famous one. Uh, barbed wire stretcher match, which uh, sounds pretty extreme as well. There was clearly no commission in, like, there's no commissioners in Japan <laughs> looking over this thing, was there? No, there's no commission there. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can even beat the fans up and they don't, they don't do nothing to you. They don't yeah, see you. Yeah, who told you that it was all right to punch the fans? This is, no one told us. We just did it and never got in trouble for it. <laughs> really? Did you ever get away yeah. with that in USWA or anywhere else where like someone tried to grab you? No. Out? If you get if you if you hit a fan, you usually get fired or fined or or uh, get sued. You you don't do that. Jeez, absolutely crazy, isn't it? Did, did he still look at it? I know it's twenty twenty one now, but would they still look it on it as a badge of honor? Yeah, yeah. I had one guy come up to me. He had a scar on his head. And he's an old guy. And he kept saying, the sheik, the sheik. And I go, no, he's not here. But he's trying to tell me the sheik cut him in his forehead 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he just wanted you to know about that. Yeah. Jesus, I tell you. Let me know. Uh, and, uh, this is skipping ahead slightly. But were there no commissions in any of the Japanese promotions? Or, you know, just looking no. over? No, there's no commission. It's, it's, <laughs> no, there's no commission. <laughs> did, you ever, did you even have to pay for, like, license, like, wrestling license, like you may have had to another... No, no, it was just uh, New Japan. You had to take a, a physical, you know, AIDS test and a blood test, I mean, and uh, that was that. Right, they just, there, there was no, there, there was no, uh, no commission. There was no, nothing, no licensing. Oh, fair enough then. Um, do you remember the first time you were asked to use weapons or go into a, a weapons match, basically? Um, well, uh, in Japan, we didn't have like weapons, weapons. We had chairs. And 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 uh, a table, you know. So the you know when my first match in Japan, we used chairs and tables. So there wasn't like I mean, kendo sticks and such. Kendo sticks came out when the guy in Singapore got cane, and so they tried to see the kendo stick was a Singapore cane, but it wasn't. It was a, sing- <laughs> it was a kendo stick, and so we, we call it a cane, but it wasn't a cane; it's a stick. You know? Yeah. So with all the, like the chairs and the t- in fact, actually, I was uh, reading all the extreme uh, stuff that you did. And I couldn't read that you ever did a bomb match or an exploding ring match. Was that? No, I, I never have. No. Is that something you would have turned down? No, I, I wanted to do one. Uh, two years ago, me and Onita was, was going to, he, he, he challenged me to an explosion match, but that never, never came about. No. <laughs> it's probably for the best, though. I mean, have you actually even at least been in the arena for uh, It's a work. They, they don't use real bombs, and it's not really electrified. It's fireworks. Well, it's, not, it's, it's not electrified and everything, but there must be something making that explosion. How would they make the like C4 boards and everything? They, they hit a button. They're backstage. They hit a button. When you hit one side of the ring, they hit a button on that side of the ring to make it explode. Oh, right. So it doesn't come from the board itself. No. It's, it, they have like uh, uh, baggies of gunpowder in it. And then when they hit the button, they, they spark up. Uh, and uh, and But uh, if the guy backstage doesn't hit the button, it don't go off. A couple of times they've done it. Where the guy hit the barbed wire and the other side of the barbed wire. Blew off. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, the I know you said that like there was like a you know you didn't turn down a bomb match or exploding ring match or whatever. Was there anything that you've ever been asked to do in your career that you said you know what that's just too too hardcore for me, man? Well, the fire match I didn't want to do it. They, they didn't ask me. They told me I was doing. It. They didn't say, hey, do you want to do a fire match? They didn't ask me. They told me. They told me the morning of the show. They didn't tell me in advance. There wasn't even no advertiser for it. For it. <laughs> so I, was, well, I, I, really didn't, I really didn't want to do it, but I did it. No, uh, I, I remember seeing this as a kid. It was like one of those viral videos before there was even viral videos. And just people get in the ring and like, get the fuck out of there as soon as possible. It's, <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was the first one to jump out. So you're the smartest one in the match then, basically? 
I would say so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's, um, like, of all the extreme stuff that you did, at least in FMW, what was the uh, worst injury that you got? Uh, I broke my neck uh, in ECW. That was the worst. And then uh, I tore my bicep. That was the second worst. You know, I had a hundred different injuries, but uh, my neck was the worst. Yeah, I'll ask about the Chris Benoit neck thing. Uh, Wikipedia, and we all know that Wikipedia is never wrong, says that you broke your neck twice. Yeah. No, um, no, no. The second time, it was a work. Tass threw him at my head, and it looked like he hurt me, but he didn't. Right. I was thinking maybe it was something in FMW that I like completely uh, missed out on, uh, with, uh, but apparently not, so that's good to clear that up. Um, Onita is a boss, and um, also, I've also read that Onita, and heard that Onita was actually even though he wasn't in a, a major promotion in Japan, was still a very good payoff man? Uh, not really, no. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, FMW, man, the, 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 those guys, were they were working for, for dirt compared to Japan's uh, scale. Uh, I got paid more than the guys that were there ahead of me, but usually the guys, they didn't make very much. Uh, who was some of the gauge, uh, guy, gaijin, uh, gaijin uh, uh, aside from yourself, who uh, made a big impact in uh, FMW at the time? Uh, well, my uncle, of course, uh, Mike Awesome, um, Horace Boulder, Hulk Hogan's nephew, uh, Dr. Luther. Um, yeah, Leon Sphinx was there before. I, I wrestled Leon Sphinx before. I forgot to say, you just ruined my next question. That was what, how, <laughs> how did Leon Sphinx get there? What, what was going on? Well, he, he went over for the tag team tournament also. The tag team tournament was, was mixed martial arts. It was a uh, Wrestlers versus boxers, boxers versus jujitsu, jujitsu versus karate, karate versus whatever. And so Leon Spinks and another guy were the two boxers. So uh, me and the Sheik was the wrestlers versus the two boxers, and it was it was the shits. <laughs> and he he won as well, didn't he, Leon? Yeah, he beat me. Oh my god! Can you believe? Did that really? <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> did that break your heart having to lay down for that one? Nah, it was okay. It was funny. He he didn't know how to work. He goes, "We're just gonna play tonight." I go, yeah, whatever. And he had a he had actually a, a nicotine patch on his arm when he went out to the ring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dearie me. It's, uh, like, so when you say he was the absolute worst, was he the worst person you ever wrestled? No, there's probably been worse. But he, he didn't, he, they didn't tell him it was a work, and they didn't teach him how to work. We taught him as each night went on because we thought he knew how to work because we figured he knew why he was there. He didn't know why he was there. He thought he was going there for a boxing match, not for a work match. <laughs> well, and nice. he wasn't in shape. He wasn't in shape at all. Well, it's nice that uh, he didn't turn up in shape and no one bothered to tell him what was actually up at all. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't you know. care. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure he got a nice payoff for it, more than the guy, yeah, at least. Yeah. Um, did you actually uh, uh, move to Japan full-time? Because I was looking back at your matches, and it seems like you are FMW straight for, like, two years. Yeah, I, I was. I moved to Japan. Well, I didn't really move to Japan. I had an apartment there because I had a Japanese wife. I don't know anymore, but I used to have a Japanese wife. And uh, uh, we, we'd stay at her parents' house between tours, but then we end up getting an apartment ourselves. And so when I had a, only a week off between tours, I would stay in Japan. But if I had a couple of weeks off, I'd go back home. No, but if I only had a short time off, I'd, I'd stay in Japan. Right. Uh, yeah, because I was wondering how come you didn't uh, basically go back and forth like most people and you were just there permanently? <laughs> But pretty much, but I had to go back and forth because I, I, I took care of my mother. I had to go back every few weeks to take care of my mother. But I spent, I spent 90% of my time in Japan. But, you know, the other 10% I spent taking care of my mother. Mm. Uh, with, uh, uh, you know, your notoriety, you're doing all the hardcore stuff in Japan for a couple of years. When did you first notice uh, that American magazines were taking note of you? Uh, tell you the truth, they wasn't. I was sending them pictures of my Japanese pictures to Bill Adler. Bill Adler didn't know who I was, and he didn't know where these pictures were coming from. So they started post printing, uh, putting these pictures in the magazines, but I was giving them the pictures. They didn't know who I was. I, I, I tricked them. <laughs> how, long did it take, how long did it take for you to do that before you started getting coverage with uh, Aptomags? A couple weeks. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. As soon as I got the pictures, I sent them to Bill Abner, and in the next month, they were in the magazine. Right. So uh, well, you saved on postage then. I thought you were going to say that uh, you were doing it for months and months. No, it was a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, who was the first person back in America to uh, take note of it and uh, hire you, basically? basically? Um, Paul, 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 uh, Dennis Carluzzo, N NWA guy out of New Jersey. He was the first one to use me. Yeah, uh, I've heard quite a few stories about Dennis Carluzzo from Kenny Bolin and <laughs> quite a few other people. He was quite a character, I, I believe. Was he just like a born yeah, shyster? Like yeah, I liked him. <laughs> Oh, dearie, mate. Oh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure you weren't taking sides with the uh, when Paulie and 
Dennis were having their spats. No, if I if I knew that was going to happen, if I knew Shane was going to do that, I would have stopped him. I, I wasn't there that night, and, and Dennis was my friend. They 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 double crossed him, and I felt bad for him because he thought I had something to do with it. And I didn't. Uh, if I don't, if I would have known about it, I would have stopped. Him. Yeah. Did you um did you have a struggle with um getting bookings? I mean, I take it you did no more bookings with him after that, after the Shane Douglas thing. Uh, no, uh, uh, we were working all the time in ECW. There was no time to take other bookings. No, well, it's nice to be busy, I suppose. Um, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll move on to, here's something that I think is probably important, uh, to mention about you is, do you think you don't maybe get enough credit for actually being quite a talented worker and wrestler because, uh, you did so much of the hardcore wrestling? Yeah, uh, people overlook my, my actual wrestling skill, that, uh, which I learned first before I learned high flying and hardcore stuff and extreme stuff. You had to learn basic wrestling. You have to have basic wrestling skills. And everybody who's trained should know basic wrestling skills. So I, was, I, I trained and studied wrestling. I've wrestled amateur for five years. And then, you know, uh, and I, I trained pro wrestling for two years before I had my first match. But, uh, you know, I, I concentrated on uh, on the mat wrestling first for my first five years. I, I never went to the top rope. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, is that because uh, your uncle wouldn't let you go to the top rope? No, he didn't want me to because I was, I was always the first match. And in the first match, you don't give him that much. Mm. You only give him a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, wh when, did, uh, when did the Sapu, uh, and Sapu the elephant boy, obviously, there was the, the uh, suffix that would come with that as well. And um, what, what's the elephant boy part first? <clears throat> Well, my uncle was a big fan of Sabu the actor, the, the guy in the Jungle Book, mm. the movie The Jungle Book, uh, Mobley. Uh, he, his name was Sabu. And my uncle was a fan of his. He used to put a towel on his head and act like him. And my uncle wanted to name his son Sabu, but my aunt wouldn't let him. So they named the dog Sabu. And then uh, <laughs> when I came along, I was actually the second Sabu. Uh, he named me Sabu. I forgot what I was getting to. Oh, the elephant boy. So uh, an elephant boy is like a cowboy. They herd elephants. In, in India. So it's a dangerous job. In India, I'd have respect of being called an elephant boy. In the States, I get laughed at being called an elephant boy because it sounds like I'm an elephant man or something. <laughs> but, so I, I dropped the elephant boy myself because nobody understood it. And I didn't, I didn't want a, a, a name where I had to explain it to people. You know what, right? You just mentioned that you said you did amateur wrestling for five years. Was that all in preparation because you knew you were always going to be a professional wrestler? Yes, it was preparing, preparing me for my job. Yeah. Um, so uh, when did you sort of like have um, the Sabu uh, name and uh, what was Sabu that all about along, now? That was about uh, 89 when my uncle named me Sabu. Uh, my first five years, I was Terry Nobody. And then because of the, you, when you first start, those matches don't count because no one's going to remember those or so we think. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I was just Terry Nobody just to learn. And then after five years, he named me Sabu. Um, I heard this, and this is actually in Chris Candido's book uh, that his brother wrote. And I've been speaking to Johnny quite a lot recently. He said, mention this. Um, before you got, like, you know, the really professional-looking, glossy, uh, baggy pants, he, he said that you may have found some maternity uh, pants from a, ch a charity shop from a Goodwill and used those as, uh, like, the baggy Arabian pants. No, 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 no. I, I got some Zubas because they were baggy pants. But actually, Van Damme's the one that turned me on to him. He had some judo pants. And I liked the way they looked. And so I got some, some uh, Zubas that looked like judo pants and made those my first pants. Yeah. And, uh, of course, when did the, first, uh, when did the table come in? Because, right, you get the credit for bringing tables to America. Uh, who's the first person? Uh, did, did you just think, there's a table, I will use it? Or did you see someone else do it first? No, um, I didn't see no one else do it first. My uncle, we had a match and, and we lost. Of course, it was a work. But he was punishing me. So he goes... Uh, get, get back in the ring and get your heat back. I go, what should I do? He goes, think of something. I said, I'll, I'll move all the table. He goes, what's that? So I go, I'll show you. So I threw it in the ring and, and I did it and it took off from there. But I did it for a punishment because I lost the match. So he, he punished me, slapped me around. Then I took on the table and hurt myself. But I wouldn't hurt myself. It made it look like it. <laughs> did, uh, did, did he get really bummed out when he started doing the moonsaults? No, he, he, he just said, no, you can't stop, you know. Uh, I'll tell you what, then I'll move on and I'm uh, going to bring up a bit of WWF stuff. And then I've got a little game for you. So, uh, but I'll ask the WWF stuff first. Uh, and I don't think you remember it that well, but uh, three dark matches, two with Scotty, two Hottie, Scott Taylor, one with Owen Hart. Uh, WWF, uh, this was in 1993. Do you remember any of these matches? And were these genuine dark matches for like a tryout to be hired or were you just showing your stuff for the future? It was a genuine tryout match. 
it was a trial match for them. I already made my decision before I went. I wasn't going to take their offer because, uh, you know, I, I already had a job in Japan, so I didn't need it. But uh, I wish I would have took it. But anyways, um, there were tryout matches there. But J.J. Dillon called me and said, Vince wants to get a look at you. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I want to bring you in for a tryout. I go, I've never heard of a tryout. He goes, well, you come in, you wrestle, and if we like you, we sign you. I said, well, I, I'm already happy with what I'm doing. He goes, why don't you just come in anyways? I said, what's the pay? He said, 300 bucks a night. So I, said, I came in for the, for the 300 bucks a night. And uh, I only supposed to have one dark match. And I had one, and then Vince had a, talk, a, a meeting with me and said, I want you to wrestle Owen Hart as my, my mark match, my fan match. I want to see you wrestle Owen Hart. And I did. And then he goes, you want to stick around another night? Uh, you, know, you have another payday. So I stuck around the third night versus Scott Taylor again. And then he, they made an offer uh, for me, and I, and I said that I couldn't do it because I already had a, a job in Japan, and, and I was going to be working for ECW. And, and Vince said, how could you – give up a, a job we have here for a company that might not even be there tomorrow. I said, I don't know. I just got to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so were you just not feeling at that time? Did you feel like, was it just because you already had guaranteed work or did you well, think you wouldn't be Well, they, they wanted to change my gimmick. They wanted me to be the sultan. They wanted me to wear like a mask with my tongue cut out or something and use the iron sheet because my manager, I, I said, there's no way I could do that. And, and uh, but that's what they wanted me to do. So they, they said they, uh, I didn't want to be changed, but they go, we would modify your look. And I go, I don't want to modify my look. I, I'm happy the way I am, which I'm still glad I, I, I turned it down, uh, you know, because I, I, I am proud of what I've done. I wouldn't have been proud if I would have done what they wanted to do. Do you know, it's so funny you mentioned that because you've got a mask and you, your tongue's cut out and you've got the Iron Sheik as manager. And that's exactly what happened to Rikishi a few years later. And, exactly, uh, yeah. And he did really well with that. Yeah, but it wasn't for me. Yeah, I, and you definitely did the right thing there as well. Do you remember any feedback when, like, after you did the dark matches? Did who came and gave you feedback, and what did they say? Jerry Jarrett said uh, I got a job, and because uh, he was there helping out, Vince came pulled me aside and said I had a job, and everybody did. All the guys who were there, they were afraid that they're going to get fired if they hired me. <laughs> so the boys didn't really like me; they were worried. Do you think you would have um, got? Because I know later with WCW they tried to tone your t tone you down with you know no tables blah blah blah. Your, WWF, do you reckon would have been the exact same deal? Yeah, but I probably would have been rich by now. You know, <laughs> it, it would have been not what I wanted to do, but I wouldn't have got paid for it. Mm. Do you reckon, uh, like you know, when when uh, you turn Vince McMahon down and uh, basically you've taken the power away from him? Do you think Vince McMahon's sort of in the back of his mind? Like when you came back, always oh, like, you're the dude who turned me down in 93. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, that's why, I don't know. Yeah, he, he like when I came back in uh, 2004, 2007, whenever that was, and, and he talked to me, he goes that, that I was one of the best workers he's seen and that I was better than he thought I was. And that, but he said I had to be a friendly baby face and he wanted me to talk. And I, I you know, I tried to resist it and uh, he didn't like that. Uh, what was the logic in you being a friendly baby face? He said the, he wanted me to be uh, the Hulk Hogan or the Steve Austin of ECW, and I laughed at it. <laughs> I thought he was joking. I go, that's so fucking funny. And, and so I laughed at him, and he didn't, he didn't laugh. He, was, he got a little mad about it. And but I, then I said, can I have a manager to talk for me? He goes, Maga has that gimmick. I said, I was doing it before Maga was born. He goes, not here, you didn't. I said, well, then Stephanie Man came to me and had a, a script for me to read. And I, and I tore it up and threw it down. I go, I'm not going to do it. And I go, how about we use that for the promo? And she didn't like it, so she ended up firing me later after that. Oh, God. Do you, remember, uh, do you remember what the first promo was that you ended up saying? I mean, how many words was it? Uh, it was a long thing. And it was talking about the big show and the ECW championship and stuff I would never say, stuff I couldn't remember anyways. But I wouldn't say it even if I could remember it. Yeah. So you wouldn't have said, I'm after a ECW championship opportunity. And you've got to use certain words like opportunity. And, uh... words, I, words I don't even, I couldn't even pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then I'm, um, I'm actually going to get to ECW in a little bit, but I'm going to skip ahead slightly. I'm going to give you, uh, give you a sort of a name association thing. So I'm going to give you a sentence. You tell me who fits the mold best. And if there's a little story that goes on with it, then please feel free to throw it in. And um, first one is the funniest person in the locker room. The bulliest? The funniest. The funniest. Uh, Sandman. <laughs> what, uh, for particular jokes or just falling down? or? No, he, he don't tell jokes. He tells stories and they're hilarious the way he tells them. <laughs> and and they, they'll be serious stories, but they're still funny the way he tells them. <laughs> Do they never actually go anywhere? 
What do you mean? Uh, have they always got a punchline, or does it do like just trail off? No, yeah, there was always a punchline, but it wasn't always a funny punchline. But the way he told it, it came out funny. <laughs> uh, last man standing at the bar. Uh, that'd be same man again. Fair enough. Well, he started before he, he started before his matches as well, so he must have. Yeah, yeah. He would he would drink. Uh, I think vodka or something, uh, hard liquor before the show, and then go up to the ring with a beer. And but he made it look like he drank beer all night. He didn't drink beer all night. He drank liquor. <laughs> he just drank beer on his way to the ring. Oh goodness me, Sam! I hope to have him on someday. Uh, the hottest, most beautiful woman wrestler slash valet in real life. Uh, Melissa Coates. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a great time to mention Melissa as well. Uh, I, I suppose to bring. I don't know if you want me to bring her up or anything, but uh, if you want to say some words about her, yeah, too. of course, bring her up. I want to. I don't mind talking about her. Yeah, uh, yeah, some words about Melissa. I, like, I, I, I found out that you know she had a lot of health problems, uh, which is like terribly, just terrible, basically like that, which uh, for the last few months. Uh, but uh, like, when did you first meet her, and um, when did she become your valet? Well, I met her about twenty years ago in L.A where they, they had a, I was up working for XPW and they wanted her to work for XPW. So they end up saying they ran out of hotel rooms and we had to stay in the same hotel room, thinking that we'd get together and then become a team and work for XPW. But the thing was, I was married. So I let her sleep in the bed. I slept in the chair. Then fast forward, you know, 15 years ago, 15 years ahead, about five years ago, she was getting bullied on the internet by these two guys who were saying that she had sex with me that night. And, and she didn't, but they were, they were picking on her. So she told me about it. And so I straightened them out and told them to leave her alone. And we became friends after that. And we started going out. All right. Did you, um, did you have any like misgivings about having you like Sabu doesn't need a manager. And then all of a sudden Sabu's got a manager. No. Yeah. No, I, I didn't need a manager. It, it was too much work chasing down the chairs and the tables for me. That's why I had Fonzie <laughs> with me. And that, that's why I had Melissa with me. But Melissa fit me good because, you know, the, the genie gimmick. Mm. Uh, whose idea was the genie uh, thing? Mine, 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 my, yeah. mine, my idea. Yeah, uh, I tell you what, I'll uh, I'll move on then. Uh, might well bring up Melissa again if we've uh, got some time. Um, and this is going. It's hard to sort of like move on from this, but uh, I suppose biggest stooge for the dirt sheets. Biggest stooge for the dirt sheets, Pa, Pa him. <laughs> You're not the first person to say that. Uh, <laughs> the, the smelliest wrestler you ever wrestled. Miles Mahoney. You're not the first person <laughs> to say that either. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who was most in trouble with the office, uh, either in ECW, WWE, or wherever? Uh, besides myself, uh, New Jack. <laughs> I'm not shocked. Uh, clumsiest. Clumsiest. Besides myself, uh, Sandman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just, this has got to be from first-hand experience. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Something vaguely in my head says lizard, 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 and I forget what it is, but I know it's something to do with the Sandman. Um, that was the time we were tripping on acid during a match. <laughs> were you tripping on acid at the same time? No, I, I, I took acid a couple of times, but I never. I was, I was too, too scared to take it before a match. I'm too scared to take it now. <laughs> I don't blame I, you. I don't want to trip. I don't want to trip. No, I know. Yeah, I, I always. I, I'm just not a drug person. I'd be so scared. Like, you know, when they give you these PSAs or whatever about, you know, you can do the one in the. Th- I will be that one in one thousand who has the bad reaction. Ends up, <laughs> ends up with my head popping off. You know, um, the greatest jobber. Greatest jobber, Barry Horowitz. That's interesting. That I don't think many people say Barry Horowitz. How can you say Barry? He was a great, great worker, and he know how to get his opponent over. Uh, a good jobber is a guy who makes the guy who's going to beat him look good. You, you know what? A good jobber ain't a guy who eats a guy up and then loses to him. A good jobber is a guy who puts a guy over and then loses to him. Yeah, and it's always nice when they don't have the ego about it as well. Yeah, well, you can't have an ego for your jobber. Yeah. Uh, stiffest puncher? Um, Sandman's pretty stiff. <laughs> but I told you before, Van Damme was pretty stiff. Yeah. Um, who was most likely to be pushed in a wheelchair through an airport? Uh, besides myself? Sandman. <laughs> <laughs> this could just be the Sandman quiz, this, couldn't it? Uh, worst thing you ever saw happen on an aeroplane? Um, i never seen nothing that bad other than uh, myself freaking out on turbulence. Oh, oh, you, uh, you terrified of flying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you... yeah and, and whenever there's turbulence, I go, whoa, whoa. And there'll be kids laughing, <laughs> laughing at me because I'm freaking out. <laughs> the old saying is, uh, don't freak out until the air stewards and stewardesses freak out. Then that's when you know when to go crazy. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> right. uh, I'll give you a few more then. Um, da, 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 da. Um, biggest ladies man. Biggest ladies man. Yes. Um, Balls Mahoney. He had rats every night. Did he really? Yeah. He, was he uh, least picky as well? He's very unpicky. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the worst hotel you ever stayed in, apart from the Travel Lodge. Travel Lodge. Oh, apart from the Travel Lodge. Uh, I don't know. Travel Lodge was the best. <laughs> what's the weird, <laughs> What's the weirdest thing you ever saw in the Travel Lodge? Uh Tommy Rich's room had a chalk outline of a dead body <laughs> and a blood spot and a blood spot in carpet. <laughs> did he even ask for a different room or did he just stay Yeah, there? they didn't want to stay in it. I stayed in the room. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. It was before we had cameras and cell phones, though, so I didn't take no pictures. No. <laughs> My God. I'd, I'd hate to say, but I would have asked for a different room. And, and, oh, it was, and a it was great, man. It was, it was the best group room in the world. <laughs> uh, who's got the worst taste in music? Uh, Van Dam, he listens to fruity music. Oh, like what? I don't know. He listens to everything, but it's nothing what I listen to. <laughs> uh, the most talented wrestler you ever wrestled? Uh, probably Scorpio or Van Dam. Mm. Good answer as well. And uh, most memorable backstage fight? Uh, New Jack threw a guy off the balcony in the back and then uh, chased him down, and I had to pull New Jack off him and <laughs> beg him to let the guy live. <laughs> uh, what's the uh, fallout over? Uh, I don't know. Uh, New Jack was fighting upstage in, 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 the, in the dressing room. You can go up, go up to the upstage in the ECW arena. Well, New Jack climbed up there in the front of the thing and threw the guy off the balcony in the back of the stage where nobody's seen it, only I did, and then came down and started killing the guy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. My, one of my next questions was going to be, uh, you remember New Jack? Everybody who says who uh, really knew him, he was actually quite a nice, easy yeah. to get along with person. It, you know, wrestling is a work. When they say you live your gimmick, that's still a work. You, you're not really a gangster or really uh, anything. So, so uh, my uncle would have loved him if, if, if he would have because he lived his gimmick. But he, he didn't believe his gimmick. He just lived it. Mm. And um, did, were you present for any of the uh, matches? Because I heard a new one recently, something about Skinhead Ivan, uh, where he ended up cutting him. But uh, did, were you present for any of the uh, uh, fabled matches where New Jack sliced someone up? No, I was usually not around or I didn't see it. And I usually didn't hear about it until weeks later. And then it was none of my business. You know? <laughs> he never done that to me, so, so I didn't get involved. No, uh, what was he like to hang out with? Was he just like the dude that everyone like crowded around in pub, uh, bars and stuff? Yeah, he, he, was, he was all right. He was always causing the scene. He was always something was always, you know, or something like that. You know, so out of nowhere, he'd come out and say that. <laughs> well, and, then it's like, and then he was off as a fight. Yeah. <laughs> and he'd start a fight. <laughs> with um, with ECW, right? Did you ever get summoned to court as a witness for any reason? Me, no, no. Because like, no. I'm trying to think how many court cases ECW caused. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was never involved in any of them. Uh, like when that mass trans incident happened, I wasn't there. I, I was in Japan. And uh, I'm sure this is something that you've asked a million times before. But uh, the first videotape of ECW that I got as a I don't know, 13-year-old or whenever it was, was November to remember, 1995. And he made a huge deal about you coming back. You know, the lights went off, come back on, and you're pointing to the sky. And Paul Heyman's there, and he's making a big deal of shaking your hand. I can't remember what was going on there, but do you remember why... I'm sure you remember why you left, and what was the deal with you coming back? The deal with me coming back was the month before, Terry Funk and Cactus Jack they had a chair on fire in the... In the they had a towel wrapped around the chair and cut the chair on fire. And the towel flew into the audience and they caused a lot of trouble. And the commission was going to shut down ECW. And they made a deal with Paul and Todd Gordon. If they run me back, the commission said if they run me back to ECW, they wouldn't shut it down. And so that's what they talked me into it. Right. So um, how come you left in the first place? Then? Was it just a money offer from WCW or, or what? Um, Long story short, I, I, had a, I had two bookings, one in Japan, one in ECW. I chose the one in Japan over ECW. Paul fired me. So three, so I went to WCW. <clears throat> three months later, I quit and came back to ECW. That's when the lights out, lights on came out. Yeah. Um, how did you end up going to WCW? Was this like a, a clandestine Todd Gordon hooked you up with it? No. I, Paul Heyman fired me. When he fired me, uh, Kevin Sullivan called me. Right then. Uh, so who? Uh, so it was Kevin. Right, Kevin Sullivan brings you in. Were you sort of like guaranteed a contract straight away, or did you have to do? Well, he didn't quite bring me in. He talked to me. 
uh, Eric Bischoff brought me in, but they gave me such a small contract. I said, uh, let's negotiate this contract. They go, uh, so, let me go back. They, uh, Kevin called me up to do Monday Nitro, and I couldn't do it. Uh, he goes, how much will it, will it cost to do our second Monday Nitro? I said, you don't have to pay me anything. Just put me over. Because we have to pay you something. I said, okay, $500, then we can talk, negotiate. So I wrestled, and, and, Paul, and Kevin Sullivan says, great, you got a job, boom, boom, boom. And then Eric Bischoff goes, I only want you to wrestle twice a month, one one day and one pay-per-view a month. And, and I go, well, how much am I going to get paid? He goes, what you want? I go, what did I want? He goes, $500 a match. I go, no, that was just for that night. It's $500 a match. And then we negotiate after if you want me or not. He goes, no, no negotiation. Take it or leave it. I said, I'm going to leave it. Right. So there was absolutely, there was no pen to paper then. You never signed anything. No, I was going to, but they weren't going to know. They weren't going to negotiate no money. I was only going to get paid a thousand dollars a month. That, that, that was bullshit. Yeah. Uh, so there was no like thoughts of staying there doing just a couple of matches a month and then hopefully get more bookings in the future. It's just like, absolutely not. No, they didn't want to negotiate. You know, he completely they had no respect for me. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't have respect for him. I still don't. Yeah. Uh, with um, it's funny actually because you mentioned the sec- it's like the second night or the third night show you want. They actually played like a vignette that Sabu's coming, or or was it? Sh- no, it was actually shortly. After, I was on the it? second night show. They played the vignette on the first night. Yeah. So that really made me think, man. I thought, you know, you're going to be in for a big money contract, and they were going to, you know, really, you know. Give you a big I, th- I thought so too, but they were dumping so much money on Hulk Hogan at the time that no one else was going to be was going to make any money. Any new guys coming in were, wasn't getting paid. Yeah, with WCW and obviously Hulk Hogan, you know, was the man there. Was there any thought in the back of your head that if you got too popular, you were you were oh, there was always that glass ceiling and Hogan's foot was on top of it? No, uh, I, I found that out later that he 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 was a little uh, jealous of me, but uh, no, I didn't think about it at the time. And what I was going to do was. My plan was to make a bigger, make some money in WCW, and make a bigger name, and come back to ECW and, and help ECW. But but Paul turned into a, you know, he bitched about it. Yeah, because uh, I was actually thinking because around the same time Brian Pillman was doing really well for himself, and the first thing that Hulk Hogan did was try and book him in a match with him where he could beat him clean. And I was thinking, <laughs> yeah. would that be you? Well, I wanted to wrestle him. I offered to wrestle him. And they said, no, his matches were picked out for the next two years. And, and him and Sting was already picked out because I wanted to wrestle him or Sting. And they said, I would never have a chance of wrestling him. But I said, I don't have a chance of wrestling the top guys. I don't want to be here. Uh, going back to ECW then. And um, I'm going to rush through a few questions and we'll get to the main event. And I will uh, thank you for your time. Um, who was your favorite uh, star? Like who, uh, like uh, WWF, WCW star to come into ECW for like one or two shots? They just thought, yes. Uh, uh, Chris Benoit was one, you know, I brought him in, he came in on, on my recommendation and, uh, uh, he was one of the ones, uh, who was my favorite. Yeah. He was there for quite a while though. I'm talking like maybe somebody who came in for one of us, like Scott Hall, Dusty Rhodes, Jake the Snake. Uh, I don't know. I didn't really pay attention to that. that much. No, fair enough then. Uh, I will move on rapidly to my next page. And, uh, if we've got time, I'll go backwards a little bit as well. Uh, right, so uh, with WWE, uh, ECW, and I'll go back to some ECW questions later if uh, we've got time. In 2005, One Night Stand, uh, which was the, uh, uh, and Hardcore Homecoming, which do you think was like the real, genuine, uh, more uh, authentic ECW flavor? The, the, the One Night Stand, the WWE was, you know, even though it was, you know, saturated with WWF guys, it was a better show. Hmm. And um, you did Hardcore Homecoming at the same time. Did that not have the same feel? No. It, no, it was a three-way barbed wire match, and, and I didn't like it. I didn't want to do it. I thought it was silly to have a barbed wire match for no reason, but I did it. And uh, no, it, I didn't like it as much. No, uh, but at least you got to wrestle Terry Funk one more time. When was the last time you wrestled Terry? Uh, that might have been the last time. It was it really? When was the first time? Yeah. Was it the first three, oh, three-way dance? The first time I wrestled him was in Japan. The second time I wrestled him in a three-way match in um, ECW. Yeah, and that was but You never really had like a long run with Terry, which seemed like a bit of a shame. Like two Japan, no, Japan legends. Um, actually, I did just that. Um, you know, Paul used him to get me over, and, and he wanted to get me over. He was the first guy of his caliber or his stature that would let me do my my stuff without without bitching about it. Yeah. Um, I think Paul probably chose really wisely, didn't he? Because he only wanted, wanted one legend for the territory, and he couldn't have picked better, really, with Terry. 
I don't think he that, that was his plan. I think it just happened that way. When EZW turned to extreme, that wasn't the plan when I first got there. It, it turned that way by accident, by, just by chance. It wasn't a, a plan. Yeah, originally when you were there in 93 for, for a few goes, when it was Eastern, I mean, they were still hiring like King Kong Bundy and Road Warrior Hawk and stuff like that. It was almost yeah. like a, ret- a WWF retirement thing. Uh, do, you remember, yeah. <laughs> do you remember uh, like the Eastern days? You were only there for a few uh, goes in 93, I think. Yeah, it was probably six months Eastern, Eastern, probably six months. Yeah, uh, when you were there, actually, who recommended you for an Eastern Championship originally? That that's where no one really brought me in. I called, I called Todd Gordon. So I, Todd brought me in. That was the same day Paul Ian was taken over for Eddie Gilbert. Well, just by chance. Oh, really? Funnily enough, I was going to yes. ask about Eddie Gilbert. So you never met Eddie in Easton. Uh, I met him the one first time I was there. He was only there one time, and then he was fired or quit, and uh, that's the only time I seen him. Yeah, I might as well bring up. Uh, I might as well bring up Paul now. Then, so when was the first time that you were on the phone to Paul and he tried and basically he said, oh, "I've got somebody on the other line. I'll call you right back." And then he never called you back. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know the first time, but he's done that so many times. Uh, I don't know when the first time was. <laughs> How long did it take for you to uh, suss out? Paul's personality? Uh, not, not long. He, he, he put me over too much. When someone puts you over that much, you can't believe it. <laughs> oh, right. To your face or to everybody? Well, to my face. He put me over so much how great I was. And I go, this guy's got to be full of shit by saying this. <laughs> did he... Um... Did, he, did Eastern, and before it was ECW Extreme, did Eastern Championship actually play, pay okay? Um, yes and no. Um, when I went, when I got double booked for Japan and ECW, it was they were, ECW was paying me seven hundred fifty dollars a match. Japan was paying me five grand a match, so I was going to get paid six grand for this one match in Japan over seven hundred fifty dollars for this ECW match. So I chose this match in Japan, and anybody else would have too. You know, Paulie would have too, but you know, he he bitched about it. Yeah. Anybody I know would have cho- chose that. Yeah, absolutely. I don't blame you. Um, other things about Paul, because I just like the little foibles and weird things like the stories. Uh, how many times were you booked on a flight under a different name? Oh, many. Every weekend. But that was before you had to show ID. You didn't have to show ID to get on the plane or you get your ticket. You just tell them your confirmation code. And, and the, the one guy who I think it was Gus Ramirez was in. No, uh, something sal- Gus Salsa or something like that was the name <laughs> he, he always used. Did you ever have like anything that was just like racially just did not not compatible, like Mr. Wong or something? <laughs> no, no. I always had like a Mexican or, or a Puerto Rican name. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get into the uh, uh, thing of, I know Paul Lee did this as well. Did you ever get into the thing of when you didn't use a ticket, you'd store the ticket and use it as currency, basically? No, I never did that. But uh, I know guys that did. Yeah. Um, also, another thing I've heard about Paul is, uh, um, I think Rob Van Dam actually said this was one time he told uh, you and Rob that you didn't have to be in for a giant meeting and then um, you two didn't turn up. And then afterwards, Paul was like, where are these two guys? And just just <laughs> for some reason, just to fuck around with you. Well, to show that we, we weren't above the law either. Ah, I see. <laughs> so yeah. he told you... Although to- we were at the time, I couldn't do no wrong. Like, Paul, there's no way he could punish me at the time. So this is the way he kind of punished me. What, what made it look like he's punishing me without punishing me? Oh, by oh, just by making a giant scene that he created. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, this one more question. I'll move off from Paul. Is uh, obviously I know it's, it's quite well documented that when ECW closed, I know it's still a sore subject that he owed you quite a lot of money. But um, when was the first time he owed you money? Because it wasn't like in the last few months. I thought it was it stretched quite f- far back, doesn't it? Yeah, every now and then a check would bounce and I'd let it go because I was doing good in Japan. I didn't really need the ECW money. I still wanted it, but I, I didn't need it. I didn't live off the ECW money. I lived off the Japan money. So whenever a check bounced, I kind of, you know, I'd bring it up to him and let it go. And if he made up for it, okay. If he didn't, not that big of a deal. But years later, it kind of added up to, you know, hundred thousands of dollars and stuff. Mm. Uh, so with, merch- money, yeah. with merchandise, uh, what sort of paid the best? Was it being in the uh, video game, computer game? Was it the dolls? I never got anything from that. Oh, really? Nobody got anything from that. Uh, Paul and maybe uh, Dreamer, but uh, no one got anything from it. Yeah, people hate when I say dolls as well. So I say every single time. Dolls, come on. 
<laughs> uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go to the uh, big main event. If you've got any extra time and you're happy to spend it with me, we will, but I'll do the uh, main event. Same as uh, the name association, but I'm going to give you some names and you uh, tell me, uh, I'm sure you're going to say pretty much they're all great guys, but if you've got a funny story to mention with them, please do. And uh, these, some of these names are going to be a bit random. Uh, so first one's Brian Christopher. Brian Christopher, who's that? Oh, that's Lawler's kid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a prick. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, he's an asshole. Is this just from USWA or is this from later years? He's an asshole every time I've ever seen him. And he was a big asshole in USWA when I was there, but he was another big asshole when I've seen him later. Every time I was around him, he was an asshole to me. So I can't say nothing but asshole. Fair enough then. Uh, was, uh, did he have I got a lot of heat for that because when someone dies, to become a saint. So when he died, I made some jokes about him and everybody was mad at me. Said, How could you say that about him? He died. I said, because he died doesn't make what he did right. He's still an asshole. I picked these names completely randomly. I didn't think I was going to get that answer. Uh, it's, it, did he just have like promoter's kid syndrome? Promoter's kid syndrome, exactly. Yeah, there you go then. P N News. Um, I did a couple of tours of him in Germany and uh, uh, France. Yeah, he's cool. I like. I liked him. Yeah. Uh, did you actually do like the catch wrestling for Otto Vance tours? Yeah. Did you really? Yeah. I, I, never I, I, I didn't wrestle him, but I did him. Yeah. Yeah. Who were you with? What years did you get? I wrestled Ulf Herman and Michael Kovac. Me and me and Van Dam did. Yeah, what what years did he go? Was it like ninety two, maybe? Uh probably ninety nine. Oh right, so quite late then. Yeah. Right, okay. I had no idea about that. Okay, I'll move on. Uh and you mentioned him before, Horace Hogan. Horace Boulder, yeah. Yeah. Uh he didn't really seem to do much in WCW, but he seems to be a pretty big star no, in Japan. He he had uh he was he was okay. He he was uh he had, you know, his uncle was a Hulk Hogan, so nobody liked him. And and since he wasn't as flamboyant as his uncle, everybody criticized him. Yeah, so unfairly criticized. So almost like promoter's kid syndrome again there. Uh, Dawn Marie. Uh, I never really dealt with her that much. I, 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 the only thing I got to say is something funny. When she, we were in that one night stand, she was pregnant. And she's something, something. I go, who's the dad? She goes, Kurt. I go, Kurt who? She goes, Kurt Angle. And I started laughing. I go, Kurt Angle. Are you married? <laughs> <laughs> Did you believe her for even a second? <laughs> well, yeah. I'm, this was so funny. She said Kurt Angle. Because when she said Kurt, I was thinking Kurt, Kurt Henning. I go, Kurt Henning, he's dead. How could he be the father? <laughs> it may have just delayed sperm or something. Uh, John, <laughs> John Cronus. Oh, he was crazy. And he, he uh, really crazy. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't crazy at Mac. He was really crazy. He, he had a mental problem. Oh, did he? And uh, how, did yeah. he, how did that manifest? Uh, I don't know how uh, how what it happened, but he like he got paid from the state for being uh, I don't want to say this, but for being uh, <laughs> for medically challenged or med medical. Uh, anyways, uh, he 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 shouldn't even been he couldn't take care of himself. He shouldn't even been in the, he should have been in the hospital. Oh right, okay. Then uh, the next one to Kevin Sullivan. He was crazy. What's that? Uh, Kevin Sullivan. Uh Great guy, one of my favorites. Yeah, I think um, yeah, it was like a small guy as well, but you just wouldn't know it in the ring. I mean, he, he was so No, but tall. he had a good mind. He had a great imagination, and uh, Dusty Rhodes liked him, and everybody liked him. My uncle liked him. He's one of my uncle's favorites. Yeah, but I mean, he wrestled like a giant as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Death, Steve Williams. Uh, he was one of my good friends. Sorry, he passed away. He was, he was a great guy. Well, when was this? Uh, when was this sort of like peaks in Japan? Uh, was it like up to ninety five? Or I just don't know Japanese wrestling that well. When I worked with him, it was uh, like ninety eight in Japan. Was it? Uh, I think you had him. Uh, it might have been a bit earlier in New Japan or something like that as well. Maybe, but don't quote me. Uh, the next one. No, uh, all, all Japan. All Japan. You wrestled him. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next one's Tarzan Goto. Uh, he was a stiff prick. I guess he was the <laughs> stiffest guy I wrestled besides uh, myself. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, I'll tell you, you're bringing them all up. Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle. Uh, he's not one of my favorites, but he's a good worker. I, I, I like his work. I just don't care for him too much. Uh, oh, I, I know you had his last match in ECW. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so uh, should I delve further or should I move on? No, it's not, the thing was with him, we had a good match. He just ruined it because he wanted to go over the match all day long and read it until the time he went into the ring. So I started to hide from him when, during the day because every time I seen him, he goes, hey, Sabu, this, that, the other thing. I go, okay, got it. I leave. And he comes, hey, Sabu, I got this, that, that. I go, no, I don't want to talk about it no more. I had to hide from him. 
as as the veteran, I mean, obviously he's been WWF champion, blah blah blah. But as the veteran, would you be the one calling the match, or did you? Yeah, uh, I called the match exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and also, actually, uh, well, he, he, you know, I, I considered him green at the time. He he was only wrestling a few years, but probably six seven years. So to me, he was still green. Mm. And he was as well. I, apparently, I actually just searched. I wonder if Sabu has ever wrestled Kurt Angle, and he did. And then apparently there was a rumor that, that like Kurt Angle was worried that you were going to hurt him or something. And he wrote back and he said, "No, he was great." But so uh, Sabu was great, very professional. That is the quote he said for his last match. So uh, he remembered it well. Uh, bam, bam, Bigelow. He was great. I liked working him. He was great. He's probably the big, the best big man I worked. I've worked. Well, uh, you ruined my next question. Who's the best big man you ever worked? <laughs> <laughs> Bam Bam Bigelow. Hey, him and, and the Big Show. Big Show is better than he gets credit for. You know, he's so big that he can crush you with a slap, and, and he doesn't. Yeah, uh, do you know, I heard recently as well, because I heard, like, negatives of Bam Bam maybe in the early career, but, like, in late career, like, he was a super generous guy. Yeah, he was super, super nice. Yeah, a super generous guy and uh, super nice. Uh, Joey Janella. Oh, I like him. He's one of my favorites now. Yeah, uh, is he um, is he in the sort of like death-defying mold? Who's who's in the uh, mold of Sabu in the new generation that you're particularly? I guess he of? is. If you want to say that he is, uh, I, and that and that uh, Jimmy Lloyd, I kind of like him too. At first, I laughed at him when I first seen him, but uh, he, he's funny and I and I, I like his work. Uh, uh, where's he based? I don't know the name. Jimmy Lloyd? Oh, you never heard of him? No, he works no. for uh, Game Changer. He's a deathmatch guy. Oh, he's a deathmatch guy. Do you like this yeah. is a weird question? But do you mentor deathmatch wrestlers at any point? Well, if they ask me, I do. But no, you know, I should because you know the, the, I should. They're just taking it too far. It's still a work, and and all, although they're giving them the people more and more, it's just more. It's it makes it more look like a work instead of a competition. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, I remember when I used to watch CCW many years ago, and it was very much you do a move on me, you hit me with a weed whacker, then I'll smash. <laughs> and it was like it was very one for one, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that? Yeah, I never got into that weed whacker shit. <laughs> is that something you actually would have turned down? Yeah, yeah, because it's it, uh, it, the same with light tubes. They don't hurt. But light tubes are a good. Uh, special effect, I guess, because it makes a good noise, but they don't hurt. In a, a real fight, I wouldn't use a weed whacker, I wouldn't use a light tube. Yeah, uh, you never got into the piranha tank thing as well, did you? <laughs> no, that's another <laughs> ridiculous thing. Not because I'm scared of it, because it's ridiculous. Yeah. There's one thing I was scared of. Uh, fish tank full of hypodermic needles. What? Pr- I was, I was going to take a drink That What What promotion was that? <laughs> that was for Wing, Wing, a company called Wing in Japan, and they had a, a fish tank with the same fish tank they used the piranhas in. They had filled with um, hyperdermic needles and they took bumps in it. Jesus Christ. Were they like AIDS infested as well? Or were they just trying to go for the absolute no, extreme? They, they were supposedly clean and new needles, but who, who, who's, who knows? You know? Yeah, I probably uh, would have turned down the pay down. I'll ask you I a few more. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few more names and thank you for your time. Uh, Giant Baba. Um, I didn't care for him that much. I don't know. Uh, my uncle liked him. And he liked my uncle and he's a, a legend in Japan. But uh, I didn't care for him that much. Was he just like a bad payoff man or didn't care for him as a boss? No, he, he, he was a big man. He only liked big guys. He was like Vince. He liked giants. So he didn't really like me that much. No. Okay. Uh, did, did you have more interaction with Mrs. Baba? Mrs. Baba liked me. I liked her. She liked me. And when everybody quit all Japan, I was the first one she called to come help. Really? Yep. Uh, when was, uh, what year was this? Um, I can't remember the year. Uh, but when Noah started... Uh, Masala took all the good wrestlers out of no- all Japan and started Noah. And the only wrestlers they left was Kawada and um, uh, this other guy. And, and so she told me that she's in big trouble, that he took all the good wrestlers with him, and that, that they wanted me to, to help out, and I did. Yeah, good for you, good for you. I've got uh, one, two, three, maybe three, four qu- uh, uh, names to give. Uh, two called Scorpio. Uh, one of the best workers, you know, uh, great guy, one of my good friends. Is other rumors true? You know the rumors. He's got a big dick. Yes. Well, yeah, he's got a big dick. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger than mine. <laughs> uh, Tracy Smothers. Uh, apparently, the oh, most naked man in the re- in the locker room as well. So here, or, or Tommy Rich, that was sorry. <laughs> but he's Tracy Smothers, he, he is the greatest guy in the world. He is the best heart there ever was. Yeah, give us give us a good Tracy Smothers story. We always like hearing one. I can't think of one offhand because it wouldn't sound funny. It would only be t- 
to imitate him. And and uh, anyways, he, he was a great guy. Fair enough. That uh, Vince McMahon. Uh, I I, met, I didn't dealt with him that much. I really I don't know him. And one of the things I had was a problem was that I didn't have a personal relationship with him, and I didn't want one. But they said that he wanted one with me, so I, I avoided them every chance I got. But he didn't like that. Uh, Bruce Pritchard. Uh, I didn't really. I don't know much about him. I, don't, I never dealt with him. Okay, I, that, you know, I talked to him a little bit. Uh, I'll tell you what. We'll end with this, and if I'll give you a few seconds to think of a good story. We mentioned the Sandman quite a lot already. But one good story about the Sandman uh, to close up the show, if you've uh, got one offhand. Well, the story where you're talking about lizard, 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 where he took the acid <laughs> and he was tripping in the ring. And uh, I can't remember. What, he, he thought he seen Godzilla coming into the ring or something. That's why you say lizard, lizard, lizard. So I know it's not funny, but it's funny to me. <laughs> was it on pay-per-view as well? No, I don't think it was. Oh, right. So it was just like, it, it wasn't like a house show, it was, was a, it? It, was a, uh, it was a house show in Pittsburgh. <laughs> oh, God, the, uh, the lizard, lizard, lizard story. I, I will have to, I'll have to find out more about that someday and like how yeah. long it took for him to recover. I'll tell you what, um, I've, I, I will just before I close up. Um, in fact, actually, I already asked this one, so I'll ask you this instead. Um, who are the guys oh, today who are really impressing you aside from, you know, like the deathmatch guys? Who are the guys uh, today who you're a fan of? Uh you ever heard of this guy called, I think I can't say his name, Schlack, Shylock or something like that? Schlack. Schlack. I've never uh, heard of him before, no. Okay, well, he's, he's one of the top deathmatch guys. I like him. I like him because he goes to the gym. The, the other deathmatch guys, they, they all have terrible bodies, and they wear a T-shirt, and they're skinny and small, or they're fat and out of shape. He's in good shape, and he does this deathmatch stuff, which I, I like him because he, he's in shape. Yeah, are you fan of like John Moxley? Because uh, he's maybe like the most high-profile deathmatch guy. Yeah, yeah, yes and no. He, I'm not that impressed with him. He's a he's a good worker, but uh, I, you know, he's just a no. I'm not that impressed with. Him. <laughs> okay, okay then. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll ask for you for some plugs, and then I'll uh, thank you for your time. We'll uh, cut this off. But uh, what would you like to plug? I know you've got a book out uh, that was out a couple of years ago. Uh, Twitter's Nathan else. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, my Twitter's uh, at Sabu. At the real Sabu, ECW, and uh, my Facebook's Terry Brunk. Uh, you can order my book from either one, and uh, that's about it, I guess. Yeah, fair enough then. Uh, and that's all we need to know. I'll put that on the clips of everything. I'll drive uh, as much uh, traffic as I can to those. But uh, listen, Sabu, thank you so much for spending uh, some time. We went just over an hour, and we didn't have internet problems. I was shitting myself over that we would <laughs> all the way through. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for joining us as well, and we'll catch you next week. Thank you.